15 minutes. Just to give you a little bit of background to myself, um, you may notice from my accent that I'm not actually from this side of the pond. I'm from the other side of the pond. And uh, so I work out of the UK. That's where I'm based. Uh, a lot of my consultancy now is international. And I help people with their overall infrastructure. The infrastructure, whether it be Active Directory, whether it be federated identity, uh, what I really enjoy is networking and getting involved in things like direct access and IPv6 as well. But it's about optimization, and it's, I have a real security slant when dealing with things as well. So what I want to cover in the next hour and 15 minutes is what's new in Server 2012 Active Directory. And there's a lot that's gone into the product. Uh, there's a few, well, things that maybe should have been there a long time ago. There's a couple of nice GUI enhancements, which I'll, I'll show you very quickly. In terms of installation, it's a lot more robust. So DC Promo has been completely revamped and AD prep and things, again, completely revamped. It is safe to virtualize DCs now. How many of you virtualize DCs currently? OK, so that's probably yeah, over a third of the audience. How many of you read the document about how to manage virtualized DCs? Yeah, that's probably about a quarter of the hands that went up before. And how many of you ever restored a DC from a snapshot? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, I then want to go on and look at cloning DCs and uh, looking how we can now take a DC and we can actually clone it and then very rapidly deploy our DCs throughout our enterprise. I also want to look at how Kerberos has changed. How many of you use Kerberos constrained delegation? OK, so again, probably, probably about a quarter of the audience. There's some really nice enhancements for that. There's been a lot of limitations around that. I also want to look at how Kerberos has changed in terms of what actually goes inside the Kerberos token. And we can use the additional information, the Kerberos token, to enhance how we control access. And then I'm going to go through things like uh, changes to the RID pool, uh, PowerShell is used absolutely everywhere, and we'll look at one or two more things along the way. But first of all, I've added one slide to the slide deck. So if you'd actually looked at the slide deck before we started, and it's this one, is what is the Active Directory? I remember asking this question many, many years ago. I actually spoke at the 2000 launch of Active Directory. Um, I was speaking at the Geneva conference. And by the way, I checked on my slide deck. And do you know where it showed the security boundary? It was around the forest. So that was significant. That was a long time ago. And then there were lots of misconceptions along the way. And interestingly, I did a huge amount of work with consultancy on AD. And that sort of tailed off. And then I moved more into identity and federation and so on. But AD consultancy has suddenly ramped up again because people are looking at their ADs and thinking, actually, you know, we built this a long time ago. Is it actually right? Should we be doing things ready for the future? So that side of the business has actually grown again. So what is the AD? And I put this slide in after listening to the keynote. And I thought, we've got our AD and our currently our Windows Active Directory. You host it on premise, or you can host it in the cloud. So you could host it in the Windows Azure Cloud. And if you want to know how to do that, come to my session, which is on what day of the week is it today? It's Monday, so it's on Wednesday. So come to that session on Wednesday. So you host it, you manage it, you look after it, you look after the data. Services you get, you get directory services with Kerberos, NTLM v2 authentication. You've got the Active Directory lightweight directory services, you've got the federation services, certificate services, and you've also got rights management services. So that's the AD that we all know and love and we've been running for years. Now we've got the Windows Azure AD. So next time you're having a conversation over a drink and someone says, oh, we run AD, you say, yes, which one? Windows Azure AD is hosted by Microsoft. They look after the infrastructure completely. You don't have to think about that. You, however, manage the data that you put in there. 
And the services, it's all about authentication and providing information, right? But the authentication is not Kerberos, not NTLM. It's all about using the new protocols for federations, such as SAML, WS Federation, OAuth, and so on. And as a component of the Windows Azure Active Directory, you also get the access control service, which is, if you like, is like an authentication broker. So you can have an application that goes up to the Windows AD for authentication, or it could go to the access control service for authentication. What the access control service will allow you to do is very quickly say, yes, I'd like my users to authenticate against Google. I'd like them to authenticate against Facebook. So you've got capability of very rapidly doing social identity to your applications. But of course, another component, you could also authenticate against the Windows Azure AD, or in fact, your own on-premise AD. Could spend lots of hours on there, but what I wanted to do was say, you're either running WAD or you're running WAD. So it's your Windows AD on-premise that you look after, or you can have your users. But what you can also do is you can synchronize. So what we can do is we can take our users that are on-premise and synchronize them up into the AD. How many of you use Office 365? OK, so all those hands that went up, you've already got a Windows Azure Active Directory. It's the same thing. It's hosted in the cloud. And it's a very robust service because it's been built out for Office 365. OK, so what I want to do is actually do a very, very quick demo of the, the GUI enhancements. And I'll just switch over to this machine in one second. And let's go across here. And I'm, this is, I, I've got two DCs running here at the moment. And what I'm going to do is actually go into Server Manager. And if you haven't seen Server Manager 2012 before, you can put all your servers in one place. And you can look at the events from all your servers. You can look at the performance on them and so on. All I'm going to do is just to actually use this to launch the Active Directory Administrative Center. Now, once we're in the Active Directory Administrative Center, um, I mean, th this came out a long time ago. We'll notice one major change, dynamic access control. I'm going to come back to that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. detail. I'll tell you what it is. We've then got my AD, and let's just double click that. And looking down there, there is no deleted objects container. So you want to enable the recycle bin. You just click over here, say re-enable it, and we'll do a refresh. And then we have the deleted objects container. And there's currently nothing in it. If we go to Demo A, Demo A is a, a OU, organizational unit. Below it is Demo B. And we've got some users. I've actually turned off. Um, deletion of object protection, so I can actually very quickly just delete de demo A out. And it's saying, are you really sure you want to do this? And yes, I am. OK, it's gone. So all my users, groups that I had in there, all my OU structure, absolutely gone. But it's sitting there in the deleted objects container. And let's restore Harry. So we go to restore Harry. And it tells me I can't do it because Harry's parent doesn't exist. All right. So we just go locate parent, restore. Can't do it because that parent doesn't exist. So locate parent, restore. So that was successful. We know we need to bring in and restore OU, the demo OUB. Restore that. Grab all our users and simply hit restore. And that mistake we made, unfortunately, where we deleted an OU, we've now recovered from it very, very rapidly. And all of the group membership and everything else, all of the attributes of the user are all retained. The other thing I want to show you is if we drill down to the system container, this is um, down here we have a password policies setting container where we can create new password settings. Now, both the re recycle bin and this have been around before. They just haven't been available to you through the UI. So here we can create a, a uh, we'll, call, we'll call this nasty. Um, now, what's the, what's the precedence level mean? It's a tiebreaker. So what we can do is we can uh, apply a password settings to a user, all right? or a group that that user belongs to. 
right? If you apply it to a user, that has precedence over it being applied to a group. So if his user is a member of a group that also has a password policy set, it will be the user one that wins. But what have we got the user as a member of two groups which have different password policies, or in fact, um, for some reason, somebody made a mistake and applied two password policies to the user. The president's number says which one wins. And it's the lower president's number wins. If you happen to have the same president's number, all right, in two password policies, which you could do, let's say they were both five, they were both applied against Harry, then what happens is the object GUID is used as the tiebreaker. So which one wins? You don't really know, but one of them will win. I mean, the point is, you shouldn't be in that situation, but the Active Directory needs a get out clause, and it just says, I'll use the object good. So we've got nasty, and I'm gonna put a precedence in there of 10, and you'll probably understand why it's a nasty policy. So just a 200 password length, we don't like Harry, so let's just add Harry in. <laughs> So Harry's now got that. Now, the other, the other nice thing which shouldn't be missed is if we go back to, if we go back to our demo BOU and find Harry, you can now view the resultant password settings. So here, we can see that Harry has this set of password set to him. Now, now, this password, how many of you use password setting objects now? Yeah, it's probably not, not a huge number, way less than a quarter. This is actually becoming more and more relevant as you take your Active Directory and you offer it as a service to your organization. So different parts of your organization says, yeah, I want to use you to authenticate my users, but actually, do you know what? My users need password strength like this. So what we can now do is effectively we can host for different customers, so our AD becomes almost multi-tenanted and we're hosting for different parts of our organization with different password policy requirements. Um, so that, that shows you that. And then the other thing is, uh, how many of you are familiar with PowerShell? Okay, probably not enough. You should probably go to the PowerShell sessions. Um, you absolutely need PowerShell, but if you're working on this, uh, it's very good. So what did I just do? I just set a password policy down here, and I can just copy that and pop that into a command prompt, and uh, there it is. There's the PowerShell that actually just did that piece of work for me. So if you're trying to get an introduction to PowerShell, how you do things in the AD, and, and you can actually effectively put up markers, so you can say, start at this point, collect all the PowerShell commands, and stop there, and it just blocks them together in the PowerShell history, so you can review it. So that was a, just a, a very quick at the look at the UI enhancements. And the next thing I want to look at is actually, um, well, one slide which says make PowerShell your new best friend, and of course PowerShell 4, have a look at that as well. Um, there are going to be some interesting announcements that you'll see in, with PowerShell 4. Comes to installing domain controllers, we're all familiar with, we put in the roles and features, and then we do a DC promo. And if you try and do a DC promo now, what you'll find is it actually tells you, you no longer do a DC promo. So DC promo has gone and rested in peace somewhere. <laughs> of course, then what happens is actually we run DC promo. <laughs> but it's through, we go in through server manager to do it. And you end up with having put in the, the roles and features. So we put in our directory services. Next job is we Having completed that, we'll be actually prompted to actually go and start doing a promotion into from just having the binaries in there to becoming a domain controller. Check out all the way through, you'll find, and, and not, not just in DC Promo, but in lots of places, you'll find places where you can pull the PowerShell scripts, you can pull the XML configurations, and then you've got a very repeatable way of doing things. So having got that far, and my mouse is, oh yes, uh, I've just missed that one. Uh, this all can be run remotely. You know when I just uh, right clicked on my domain controller? and said, run administrative for the center, I could have right-clicked on a 
a machine which has actually got um, you know, no roles installed, just a fresh vanilla server, and just said, install the roles and features, and I could have done, effectively started my promotion of my domain controller through that. OK, so next, what we do next is we have this little triangle which tells you you need to do a little bit more work, and that's promote the server to being a domain controller. So we start the process, and a lot of this will look familiar, um, although there are sort of some significant changes in here as well. So add a domain controller to an existing domain. I'm not going to go through the list. It's all, all familiar stuff. We can now specify the domain information for this operation. So we, we specify the domain that we're going to do. But the key on there, we can specify credentials at this point as well. All right, so we can actually put in the credentials. And the target forest that we're going to be using has got to be server 2003 functionality level or higher. So if you're bringing a 2012 machine in and you want to promote it to being a domain controller, you've got to be server 2003 forest functionality level. All right? Now, hang on a minute. What about AD prep? How many of you have run AD prep before now? OK. And which server did you do the domain prep on? The domain prep was done on the infrastructure master, yeah? And schema prep, which one did you do that on? Schema master, that was the easy question. OK, so why the infrastructure master? Any ideas? Well, it knows everything. Does it know everything? Because it might not, because it, in a sort of multi-domain environment where all your domain controllers aren't uh, global catalogs, it's not a global catalog, is it? What does the infrastructure master do? Yeah, it looks after cross-domain links, all right? And if you're a global catalog, you know all about that, so you don't have any of these links. It sort of manages phantom objects and all sorts of things. Reason they chose the infrastructure master for doing the AD prep was, well, hang on, what can we use? Well, the infrastructure master doesn't do very much. We'll tell people to run it on that. Right? There was no, nothing more significant. They just wanted one domain control to do it on. But we haven't even looked at that. We haven't even thought about doing that here. So we can then go on and say, do we want it to be a DNS server, global catalog, RODC, choose the first site? And uh, we put in our directory service restore mode at that point. And then we specify in terms of delegation options. And we can supply credentials here as well to do the delegation for DNS. So we've got the DNS delegation uh, credentials we can supply. Next thing is um, we can specify Right, that we want to install from media. All right, how many of you have done an install from media? Okay, that's again less than quarter of the audience. The idea of install from media is we've got a domain controller and it's got its database on it. So what we can do is create what's referred to as an IFM seed. All right, the IFM seed is effectively a copy of that database, and then we can ship that copy over to a domain controller on some site that doesn't have great connectivity back to the mothership, right? and then we can do install from media, and it actually takes the database from the IFM seed. The IFM seed was always a little bit tricky to create, um, and one of the things that you had, you used NTDS util, but one of the things it wanted to do, NTDS util, before it would create you an IFM seed, it wanted to do an offline defrag, all right? Well, what it does is it creates the seed and then defrags it, all right? What's the difference between an online and an offline defrag? Perfect answer. The offline defrag shrinks your database file size. Right? So what an online defrag does, and it happens very often, is you've got lots of pages inside your database. So an online, just you know, you've deleted objects and things, it just crunches up and gives you more con contiguous page space. So it's crunching the stuff up, but it doesn't shrink the file. So an offline defrag actually f shrinks the file size. And if you've got a very, very large database, uh, you have to take the directory offline, and then you do an offline 
defrag, and it can shrink it down. Right? You don't really very often want to do that because most times these days, people have got such large drives. The time you might do it is if you had a machine which you said, well, it was a global catalog, but we don't want it to be one anymore, and we're in a multi-domain environment. It's got a huge number of objects from other domains. Let's shrink the file size down. Well, regardless of whether you wanted to do it or not, NTDS Util used to do it, right? So you could actually be waiting hours for your IFM seed, and the database was big enough, it could probably stretch into days. Right. So now you can actually specify not to do one. Um, so that's the install from media. You can then specify where you replicate from. So you know, if you've got a number of DCs and you say, actually, I'd like to take to replicate from that one, you can do that. You've then got um, the ability to specify database folders, et cetera, et cetera, just as normal. And then what it will do, uh, it will tell you that if you're bringing this into a non-2012 domain, right, it will say that I need to do a forest prep and a domain prep. And it just does it for you. You know, you don't have to specify the servers it's going to use or anything else. And you like that. <laughs> well, it's jolly good, because if we couldn't remember, if we couldn't remember whether we put it on the infrastructure master or the something else master or the something else master, uh, we don't have to think about that anymore. So that, just remember that, so when you're talking to your grandchildren, you can say, I remember the time we had to do a domain prep on the infrastructure master. And they'll probably look at you as a very sad person. <laughs> um, to do that, obviously you need enterprise uh, privileges because you're doing a schema master update. Now, if you don't want to do it here, you just run AD prep, and you just run it, and it figures out so as an enterprise administrator, you run AD prep, it figures out where it needs to do the AD preps, and it just does it. So you don't have to be an enterprise administrator to install your first domain controller in. But if you are, then you can just carry on. OK, next job, um, it gives you a sort of check. And what it's doing, it's doing a, a prereqs check. And it's going to go through the whole thing. You've got a script you can view. So, so a lot of this stuff was already there to a certain extent. There's a lot more checking as it goes through. And the good thing is it doesn't wait until you get to the very, very end to do the check. So anytime you do something wrong or it doesn't like something, it will check every stage. So you don't have to go all the way through. And then it goes through and says, oh, no, this isn't going to work. All right, so it's checking all the time. It does a final validation, and then it completes the promo. And so that's, that's the putting in this. There's, a, as I say, a lot more validation, a lot more health checking along the way. And finally, we get a domain controller. But when it comes to virtualizing domain controllers, this is where we run them in a virtual environment. This has always been slightly tricky, because Restore from image any problems, and the answer is yes, 100%. If you've got, a, got two domain controllers running virtualized, and one goes down, and you say, I know, no problem. I'll just go back to the previous snapshot. Or I've got a VHD here. I just load it in, and off we go again. And if we just try and understand the problem a little bit, what we have is one domain controller uh, is actually going to keep a vector on the other domain controller to say what updates it's had from it. And it's a way more complicated than this because there's lots of vectors. But what this is just to give you an example. So what we have is two DCs up there. One has an invocation ID of E, and one has an inv invocation ID of M. And think of the invocation ID as a database name. Right? It's the name of the database. And then we have a highest committed USN update sequence number on our own machine. So every time we change a value, right, an attribute value, that USN gets bumped up. Right? And then on what we do is we keep a vector to every single other database we know about saying that we've had from and this is showing there. This guy on the, on the right is saying, I've had everything from M up to 3,000. Well, if you look over there, 
the highest committed sequence number is 3,000. Right? So as far as it's concerned, it's fully up to date. And then the other side is keeping a high water mark vector to database E of 1,000. OK, we take a snapshot. Next thing is time moves on, and things change, attributes change, and so on. And after replication, we'll have the appropriate high watermark vectors again. So the second line there, everything is up to date. So we've got a high watermark vector to M of 5679, and a high watermark vector to E of 4567. And then we end up with the guy on the right failing. But you took a snapshot, didn't you? So what we'll do is we'll just put the snapshot in. OK. Anyone see a particular problem that might be occurring? This guy says, I've had everything from M up to 5679. All right. This guy says, I've had everything from E up to 1000. Which way will we get replication happening? Will it go from the guy on the left to the guy on the right, or the other way around? So which, which server is going to be happy? Well, think of the answer, and then we'll get to the next slide. <laughs> so there's our situation. Uh, we had some users, just to complicate matters. All right, so our snapshot, we just added a whole bunch of users on it. So the USN has just bumped up to 3050. And then replication happens. It says, send me all your changes from 1,000. No problem. Over there you go. All right, everyone's happy. It says, I've currently got everything from E up to 1,000. So he says, send, send me all your changes from 1,000. He figures out all the changes he needs to send and sends them across. That all works beautifully. And then the next thing is, we have, he says, send me all your changes from 5679. And this guy says, there aren't any. And then things get worse. <laughs> because what's happened is you've gone back in time. All right? So you've just screwed up replication, technical term. Screwed up. Screwed up replication. But you dropped back in time, and things like your RID pool, which makes your SIDs unique, you could be issuing SIDs you've already issued. And if those SIDs are being used in access control lists, we're now, we've got duplicate SIDs happening. All right? So Microsoft thought, mm, bad idea. So in, in uh, 2003, SP1, they brought in quarantining. So this, you said, send me your changes from 5679. There aren't any. So he says, that's very weird. How can he be more up to date than I am? Because I've got the changes. So he basically, this guy now says, there appears to be more update. It's not right. So what I'll do is I'll log an entry, put an entry into the event log. And then he says, I'll disable my inbound and outbound replication, and then I'll shut down my net logon service. So am I a DC anymore? No. So that sort of, to a certain extent, helps you, but you could end up with duplicate RIDs in your domain and all sorts of issues. So we need a solution for that. And the 2012 solution is they've introduced what they call the VM generation ID. Right, it's a 128-bit number, and 64 bits of it is exposed, and it's exposed up through the uh, BIOS AP, APCI namespace. So this generation ID is generated down at the hypervisor level and is exposed to the host that's running, so the host can actually read that. And what it does is it reads it and checks it against a stored value that it has. And provided the same, everything's happy. But if it changes, it says, oh, I've gone back in time. Right? And it, needs to it can then start a recovery from that. So the VM generation ID is set during a VM import. So if you import a VM, you do a copy or you apply a snapshot. 
When you take a snapshot, the generation ID doesn't change. It's when you apply it that it changes. So when the DC boots, if the generation ID is changed, then what it does, it assumes that it needs to do an AD restore because it says, I've gone back in time, so my database is useless. So what I'll do is an AD restore. Well, it's already got the database. So to do an AD restore, what it does is it changes its invocation ID, right? So it's changed its database name. So that guy over there that had all the vectors across to this guy, those vectors are no longer valid, right? So this will be seen as a new replication source. Um, it then it changed, it invalidates the RID pool that it currently has, discards it, and goes and gets a new RID pool. And then it says, OK, I better make myself non-authoritative for Sysvol and do a restore. And that way, we come up all squeaky clean and everything works. All right? But notice that it's saying the database on my machine is valid. All right? This is not a solution for actual AD restoration, all right? So this is a, if you like, a protection mechanism. So you should still be doing your standard AD backups and so on, and not relying on these snapshots. However, the snapshots will come up, and they will come up properly. Hypervisor support, well, you could expect hypervisor on all the sort of Windows products or work. There's Hypervisor, if you're running um, Hyper-V on Windows 8, and uh, I'd, I haven't checked it because I haven't tried my copy yet, but I would imagine 8.1 so, and t Server 2012 R2. Um, but also there's VM Workstation 9 supports it, and also uh, vSphere supports it as well. Uh, watch the space because more and more people are committing to supporting this generation ID good. So what I want to do is do a demo of this. And I'm going to actually, first of all, look at, uh, I'm going to do this on DC2. So on DC2, if we go over there. And what I'm going to do, first of all, is look in the event logs. And what I'm doing is I'm looking. This is my directory service event log. This is just after I've started up. Uh, that warning, by the way, is probably something about uh, it's just a, a security warning in terms of um, NTLM, et cetera. Um, but this one is the first one. Uh, nope, sorry. Let me just close that. 168. Right, let me. Can you actually see that at the back, or do you want me to zoom it? Zoom it, right. OK, so this is showing me that my current VM generation ID GUID is 112561, et cetera, OK? And then what it's looking at is it's looking at the next event, and it's, it's reading, on the next event, it's actually reading the MSDS generation ID attribute from the domain controller, and it happens to be the same value. So it says everything's OK. I haven't been put back in time, so I've just carried on. So if we just grab this value and copy it, and let's just put it into Notepad. OK, is that, is that big enough at the back? See? Yep. OK, um, so where does that come from? Well, if I go into my hypervisor config or my virtual machine configuration, so we need DC2 on here, um, hyper-v DC2 and virtual machines. And if we look inside here, and we look for the, the gen ID, uh, sorry, gen, not generation ID, so let's gen, let's just look for gen. There it is. So we've got, let's move that down there. Let's move um, that up there. So let's, let's see if we can zoom that. I bring them to cl close together and do an F1 on there and bring it down. So what you've got there is the generation ID string is F004. And, and you can see the two match. <laughs> no? OK. So 
I, th this, this worried me because I wanted to be able to check um, why these were the same. So I, I had to do quite a lot of digging. Um, I couldn't find it documented anyway. This is actually is exposed to two 32-bit numbers in, um, in through the BIOS. And so I thought, I know what I'll do. It's two 32-bit numbers. So this must be 64 bits. So what I'll do is I'll use LDP, which has a very nice little utility called the uh, large integer converter. I pop that in there. I would split it. So, sorry. Pop that in there. And then I'd split it. So now I've got two 32 bit numbers. Don't worry if you can't see the numbers at the back. You, you'll see where I'm going with this in a second. So copy that and bring up calculator and go into program mode or programmer's mode. And then what I can do with that is I can paste that and then convert it to hex, and then copy that, and then pop that into Notepad here. It's actually dropped off the leading zero, so I'm just going to pop that on so the number's the correct length. And then what we'll do is we'll take the second one from there. All right, my mouse is sticking. Take the second one from there, and we'll paste that in. Oops, sorry. Switch that back to decimal, paste that in, convert it to hex, and grab that. And then what we'll do is we'll compare the two again. So I'm just going to bring this down. And I'm just going to highlight that. So those at the front will be able to see it. But now we'll. Zoom it. And the numbers are the same. So it's taking the lower 64 bits of the generation ID GUID, exposing it up through the APC BIOS, and then that's how the, the two numbers relate. So if you, if you need to double check, you can actually see that they are the same numbers. It's a little bit tortuous, but it worried me when I couldn't actually validate the number against what the hypervisor was presenting in the configuration file. And I wasted a lot of time doing that, but then I do those sort of things occasionally. Um, the other thing that's actually, just as, as a tip, um, let me just show you this. What, what I do is I don't, when I'm doing demonstrations, I do not necessarily want these machines to come up and go through this restore mode. And if I've got multiple DCs, and if I just snapshot them and bring them up, they all go, oh, I've gone back in time. So they all invalidate their RID pool and everything else. That's fine. AD replication works brilliantly. But then they all sit there with Sysvol saying, I'm not authoritative. I'm going to wait for a partner who's authoritative. So what happens is Sysvol no longer replicates. So what I do is I actually, um, just to, as a sort of trick, just to show you, is I store my generation ID good. And then I reset it in the file before starting up the virtual machine. And if you go to reset it, and, and you go in there and you go to save, what you'll find, it's, it says the file is locked by a process. Don't worry about it. Go save as, and then click OK, and it saves it. All right? So if you go save as, you can actually save it back as the same, same name. So that way, you can set your generation ID GUID correct. OK, let's just move on from that. We'll leave LDP open. I want to use that in a second. And what I'm going to do now is um, let's make sure I'm, I'm on I've too many things open now. All right, so let's, uh, let's go into Active Directory Users and Computers on here. So Active Directory Users and Computers, let's create a new group. Why group? Um, simply because it's the quickest thing to create, um, which will have something that will have a SID. So we'll call this one. And if we use LDP, what I can do is just have a look, close that off, connect, and actually just check it's connecting to this server. Connect and bind. OK. And if I go down to view tree, and um, I want to look in my main domain naming context, go down there. And this is horrendously small. Unfortunately, you can't set the fonts in advance. Let's go up to 18 point on that. OK, 
Um, what I'm looking for now is I'm looking for one which is there and notice the SID is 1607 so let's just record that so one is 1607 okay so that's the SID of the group I just created well it's not the SID it's the relative ID at the back end of the SID the main part of the SID is actually the domain identifier. So that is the domain authority, and that is the relative ID, which is bumped up every time we create a new security principle. Okay, so let's do a snapshot now of AD2. So we'll just call this snapshot demo. That's fine. And what I'm going to do now is create another group and we'll create this other group called, um, and we'll create it called two. And go on very easily. What's the SID of two going to be? What's the number? What's the what's the RID on two going to be? One six zero eight. Easy, isn't it? Okay, there it is. One six zero eight. So we'll just we'll just record that, and then we've got two at one six zero eight. And then what I just want to do is make sure, I should have done this before, but I just want to make sure those have both replicated across. Uh, so we'll just check that they've come across over here. So let's do a refresh. And one and two are both over. So they're both on DC1, okay? So they're, they're both sitting there. So on DC, DC2, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to revert, okay? So I just took a snapshot before I created two, and I'm going to revert. You sure you want to do it? And the answer is yes. And there we are. Oh, look, two's disappeared. Well, you'd expect that. So let's have a look now in the event log to see what's going on. So we go to the event log, and we do a refresh on the event log. What we'll see now is, and I'm looking, where are we? Uh, 12170. And what it's showing, and I'll just bring that up here, it's showing the generation ID has changed, has been detected. The old value, all right, and we've got the new value. So it's saying, hey, I've gone back in time. So the next thing it's going to do is it's going to abort any transactions it's in the middle of. So that's basically that one's telling us we've aborted any transactions. And then, this one I want to show you, it's, it's telling me, the top half of this is sort of telling me we could have problems, and it's now going to tell me what I am going to do. And let's see if I can get that sorted so we can see it at the back. So I'm going to create a new invocation ID. I'm going to invalidate my current RID pool. Um, I'm going to start SysVol replication service restore options, and then what after, after, after everything's working nicely, I'll request a new RID pool. So that's what, they, what it's going to do now. So if we carry on up through there, and the next one I want to look at is 1109. I'm not going to look at them all. And what it's got in there, and I'm going to grab this and just pop that into Notepad. And so that is its old invocation ID. Remember the invocation ID, GUID, is really the name of the database. There's the old one, and there's the new one, OK? And then if we close that for a moment and just pop up, the next one I want to look at is 2185. And what this is doing, uh, in fact, I went, sh I'll just, if this is actually saying, look, hang on a minute, I'm going to have to do a sysfull restore. So we can escape from that. So that's a sysfull restore. And then finally, what we've got is a 2187, which says that sysfull is finally up and running and happy. OK, so that looks pretty good. So what we do now is we'll go into Active Directory using computers and create a new group, which we'll call 3. OK, and if we check the SID on this one, so hang on, did I finish that? I don't know what I did, actually. Yes, I did, three. And then if we just close that off and check the SID on three, 
There it is. OK, what's it going to be? What's the RID going to be on 3? 608? 609? What will it be roughly? I don't expect the exact value. It'll be bumped up by how much? 500. And why 500, sir? At least 500 RIDs in the pool size. Well done. Great answer. So what's happened is we've invalidated the RID pool. We've got a new RID pool. It will be somewhere. It will actually be somewhere between 200 and, and you know, 55 or higher or, or 500. So if we just have a look at that, then we can actually look in at 3. And what we can see is it's 2102. So we've actually bumped up. Let's just grab that and pop it into Notepad. And so 3 is that value. So it's bumped up by approximately 500. And that's because it invalidated its rib pool and it went back for a new one. All right? And if we do a refresh on this side, if we go in here, let's just do a refresh here. Uh, let's try and do a refresh in the right place. One, two, three, all back happy. And if we go across to our DC1 and we do a refresh on here, we've got uh, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, all happy there. And then what I just want to show you is if we have a look and do, um, oh, sorry, didn't want to do that. Uh, the, there's a whole raft of new replication. Um, commands. So replication attribute, metadata, connections, uh, failures, partner metadata, queue operations, site, site links, site link bridges, subnets, and what I want to do is look at my up-to-dateness vectors. And I need a target, which is AD DC1. And what we'll see is if we've got three, we've actually got the uh, vectors in here. And we've got an in, a partner invocation ID of F8. This happens to be myself because I keep a vector on myself. And then we've got a partner invocation of 4288. And if we look back at, let's get DC2 up, notepad. Sorry, uh, where has it gone? So 4288 and uh, F8, F7. And if we just pop back over to the other guy. So 4288 and FF87. So what it does, it keeps the old vector because it doesn't really know what's happened to that other database. All right? It's disappeared. And it will keep that vector for some time before it finally ages out of the cache. But what it's doing now, it's saying, I've got a new database to replicate with, and I'm happy. And that, that's the whole process that goes on behind and underneath this virtualization safe. Um, so I just want to, you know, rather than just saying, oh, it's virtualization safe, actually show you the process that goes on underneath. After all, this is an after lunch, sleepy session, level 300, so it's got to have a bit of technical content. DC cloning. When we come to cloning, cloning relies on this invocation ID good. So what we do is we start off with a source DC. Uh, we have to have a PDC emulator which is 2012. That's all you need. PDC emulator with 2012 and your source DC. Source DC, obviously 2012 as well. Everything else could be other versions of Windows. We add the DC we want to clone into the clonable domain controllers group. All right? If you don't have a clonable domain controllers group, it means you do not have a 2012 PDC emulator because that's the point that the group is created. All right, so when you actually make a 2000 service over the PDC-E, then it will create that group. Next thing, what it's going to do, it's going to check this thing called the ADDC cloning exclude application list. And what it's doing, it's going to look at your machine and say, look at all the services and things that are running on it, and say, are they in the list? If they're in the list, it will say, it's good for cloning. If they're not in the list, it will warn you. You then remove incompatible components, or you declare them safe. 
All right, so you know, Microsoft have declared their own components safe, but if you were running something else on there, then you would have to decide whether this application was clonable or not. It then we get a DC clone config file. We create one of those. And then what we do is we shut down and we copy. And what we can do is we can load that DC clone config file onto your source DC, or you can load the, the virtual the VHD or the VHDX and add the file to that. So you've got that option. So that file could be loaded in. And where, where, where is that file? It could be on removal media. It could be, by default, it goes into the NTDS directory. All right, it's the, the directory that holds your, your database. You then use that, copy it across. You make a new virtual machine with this VHD. You fire it up, and you have a DC. It's a superior form of install from media, if you like. So install from media, you copy the database, and, and then you start your DC promo and say, use this database. Well, what's happening here is you're saying, here's DC. It's got the database on it. What we'll do is we'll put it in a state where it will change itself suitably based on the, uh, the, the uh, XML file so you can bring it up and it's operational. Um, and what, but it does rely on the VM generation ID changing. So when you copy and you create a new VM, there will be a new VM generation ID. And it will say, ha-ha, oh, look, there's an XML there. I better clone myself. All right, so if there's no XML, it doesn't do a cloning. So it's looking for that XML, and then it clones. So that's sort of what it looks like. 90% complete, and it does it very quickly. So it's just a little, takes a little bit longer than just booting the, the, uh, the machine. The default uh, clone XML, um, you get to it with get ADDC um, cloning exclude application list. And um, <clears throat> if you decide that something on your machine is clonable, then what you do is you do exactly you do a get ADDC cloning, et cetera, and then you put a dash generate XML on the end of it. And it creates a custom XML, which actually gets put into the NTDS directory, which will al then allow cloning to take place. When you create a DC clone config file, you can put in all the things you need. So the fact that you want this particular DC to have these particular IP addresses, and I've just got IPv4 on there, but you could have IPv6, subnet masks, default gateways, uh, DNS servers, the name of the machine, the site it's going to be in, and so on. So there's a lot of, of options available that can go inside the uh, DC clone config file. You don't have to create this. You don't have to get your XML editor out and create it. You, you basically supply it all in a PowerShell command line, and it creates that XML for you. Um, so what I'm going to do is just, uh, just going to clone DC2 and uh, show you how that actually happens. So we take DC2, and I'm going to clone this guy. So. On, uh, we're on uh, ADDC1 at the moment. We just need to move over to ADDC2, and we bring up here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a get ADDC clone exclude list. And it goes through, and it runs through, and it's looking at everything running. And it says, the browser can't be cloned. And you think, that's crazy. Well, actually. It can be cloned. What I did is I modified the default cloning file just to demonstrate how. So if we go down into the Windows directory, system32, and what I'm looking for here is default clone allow list. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to do that. Edit. And we go down through. This is all the services that are considered to be compatible. And what I did is I just changed the name from browser to browsers, just for the sake of the demo. So what it's doing, it's going down. It's looking to see if anything that's running right, is actually in this list. If it's not, it complains. So we've got this thing complaining here. 
Um, the best way of actually doing the cloning is to do it on a live system. You can create the configuration via the XML on a system that is not live, so we could do it on a workstation. Problem is that you do that, it doesn't do the validation checks. So what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to do a new um, ADDC clone file. And what it's done, it's done a couple of checks. It says the domain controller hosting the PDCM editor is server 2012. That's great. Um, it's a member of the clonable DC uh, group. And what it's done, it's, it's failed on this check of the exclude list. So what I can do is I can actually go here and use generate XML. And now what it's done, it's created a custom thing saying this thing called browser is now compatible I've, because I've decided it, it is. And now what I can do is I can run the previous command, but I don't want to do that. What I want to do is use this one in here. And, oh, sorry, wrong way, word wrap. So what this is, is setting my IP address and all the rest of it. So I'm just going to, so grab that pop that in there, and everything's happy. It's passed all the uh, cloning requirements, and now if I go into the NTDS directory, which is here, uh, what I've got, there's, there's my custom clone allow list. So for those at the back, so it just simply added browsers, browser in there, and there is my cloning config file and so it's got all those settings that I supplied in the actual command line. Right. This I can copy off this machine. Right. I can put it on a USB stick or whatever I want to do. I can modify it and put it on multi. So I can take an image and clone it many, many times with the settings that I actually want. So that just uh, takes you through and gives you an idea of uh, how, how the, the cloning operates. Uh, Kerberos enhancements, um, there's some sort of major changes to Kerberos, um, but, well, they're not absolutely huge, huge, but they, they're fairly major. They're, they're there for enterprise uh, organizations. How many of you have blown up your Kerberos token size? Actually, that's quite a large number, just slightly probably under a quarter of the audience. Uh, you've now, the, all your group membership goes inside the pack. There's now pack compression capability. Right. The buffer sizes are bigger. There's warning events for large token sizes. All the things were, would have been useful to have had around for years rather than just have our, our Kerberos token get too big because of that group membership. So there's an increased logging there. There's also this new support for constrained delegation, also claim support. In terms of constrained delegation, the idea of constrained delegation is you uh, or user hits your front end, let's just call it a, a web server, right? And then this web server wants to go off to a back-end system using the identity of the user, right? And we've actually got a delegation taking place. So we hit the back-end system with the identity of this user. And there were restrictions that the front-end and the back-end servers, the, the accounts running the services on the front-end system and the back-end system needed to be in the same domain. Right? That restriction has now gone, which is, for a lot of customers I've worked with, will be a godsend. The other thing is you can actually do it across between, uh, between domains, so you can do a cr and you can do cross-forest delegation as well, so we can achieve that. The, the other thing that with constrained delegation, one of the problems is we've got an application that is going to be allowing the delegation to happen to it. Where was that delegation control? It was all controlled up in the AD. So we've got the application manager that actually has no control over who's going to delegate to it. Now we've got this ability to protect the back-end services by actually setting who can actually come and delegate to the server. So again, that's another benefit. I suppose the, the more interesting enhancement is, is if we look at the token pre-Windows 8 and Server 2012, what it was, the Kerberos token had all the group membership in pack. What you can now do in the pack 
is you can put user group information, device group information. So now, inside that Kerberos token, which is presented to the server that the user needs to gain access to, is not only the user's group membership, but the group membership that the device belongs to. So now we can say that user can gain access provided they're looking, working on a device that is owned by, I don't know, the HR department. So we can make decisions like that. We can also put claims in there, and a claim is a Windows AD attribute that has been marked for going into the token. So now, if you think about group membership, you know, we've got uh, an HR group and a this group and a that group and so on. But the fact you're a member of HR may well be in an attribute in the AD. So you can simply take that attribute value and place it into the Kerberos token. And it allows you to create a completely new access control model. So files can actually now be classified and tagged. So, and we can do this for access and also for auditing. Expression-based access control. So we can now say if a user is a member of or has a claim of and device right, has a claim of, then allow access. So we can come up with really complex and meaningful expressions for controlling access. So in this example here, what I've got is user department equals corp sales, user job title equals sales manager, and device department equals corp sales. Allow access. Where are the groups? There aren't any. They've all gone. So we're now, we're now basically controlling access based on attributes that are contained in the AD. All right. And if you're interested in this, I did notice there's one session um, on controlling access and be using dynamic access control. So expressions can contain groups, users, and users and device information, device claims, and you get a very, very rich dynamic access control. But this is allowed through the fact that we can, Kerberos has been modified in the AD to allow the addition of user and device groups and claims. Um, the other thing is there's, uh, the, to get sort of uh, enabling claims, what you enable is fast or Ker Kerberos. Uh, it's called flexible authentication secure tunneling, and that in includes the claims piece. But it also prevents the Kerberos spoofing that can take place. The problem is when you log on and you validate the first time, right, you've actually got a timestamp which has been encrypted with a hash derived from your password. And that's passed over the net. So it's possible for someone to get that and do a dictionary attack against you and actually get your password. Right? This, is in, this is in the Kerberos protocol. That can now be armored. So that interchange is now fully protected. Um, and also, Kerberos error messages can be signed to prevent spoofing. So what you could have is I could set up an application server. You come to me. And I say, I can't do Kerberos, all right? Well, if the application server said that, it would now have to be assigned, I can't do Kerberos, all right? So we, we can actually manage the, the error message to prevent spoofing. Um, there are things called exhaustible resources, DNTs. A DNT, every time you put something in the database, the DNT gets bumped up, all right? And it's actually held in a 2 to the power of 31-bit uh, number, which is approximately 2 billion. And once you've created 2 billion things in your AD, right, and they don't have to, you, this DNT is never reset. So every time you create a new object in the AD, you get a new DNT. Object goes in a table, right, effectively. It's a row in a table. The DNT identifies the row. And then you've got you know, your attribute values as in the columns, if you like, in the very simplest terms. So this bumps up every time. The DNT, once you've got to your 2 to the power of 31, you can no longer put anything further into that database. All right? And you've never been able to monitor the DNT. You can now actually look at it. It's a constructed attribute, which is part of root DSE. So you can actually see where your domain controller is in terms of being exhausted. If it gets exhausted, no problem. Just 
demote it and re-promote it. Because what will happen is all those things that have been deleted, all right, will simply now will put things back in with new DNTs and we'll start from the beginning again. So that's not an issue. SIDS, we've got the RID on the end of it, all right? And the RID is, you know, we get bumped up every time we create a new user. And there is a limited number of RIDs you can actually have in the Active Directory. And the number of RIDs you can have is actually that number up there, which is 1,073, oh, effectively 1,073 million RIDs. 10,000 RIDs per day, and you'd be good for the next 294 years. So why is it an issue? You could have a rogue script that keeps invalidating RID pools or creates thousands and thousands and thousands of objects, and you hit your RID limit. Once you hit your RID limit, right, your domain is finished in terms of creating new security principles. Right? You can't demote your DCs and start again. Right? You've hit the ceiling. Right? It's not, you know, it's only going to affect a few customers, but it's always been claimed, you know, it's held in a 30-bit number. Why couldn't it be a 32-bit number? Well, what Microsoft have done is they've released the next bit, so it can now be in a 31-bit number, right? Um, and another thing is, if you're doing recovery, one of the things you do is if you're doing an AD recovery, you can elevate the RID pool. If you make a mistake and make it a very, very large RID pool elevation, then again, you can cause yourself problems. So again, by being able to lift the ceiling on the number of RIDs generated is uh, very good. The other thing, there was a little bug, um, and it's now been fixed. There is a hot fix for it. Uh, it only occurred on very rare, exceptional circumstances. Uh, if you want to have a look, look at that KB article. But it meant that a machine was actually requesting a new RID pool every 30 seconds. You know, and if you had lots and lots of DCs that all had this problem, and they were all requesting the RID pool every 30 seconds, boom, 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 you get moving up towards your ceiling. So in Server 2012, number one, they give you a warning where 10% usage of remaining RID pool size. So that's after the warning, it recalculates the 10% marker, and repeats the warning. So if you see this warning, don't ignore it, right? You need to sort of find out why you're losing your RIDs. Um, and then there's a ceiling at 90% usage. And that's it. It stops. No more security principles. All right? But it's something that you can remove that block. So it's an artificial ceiling. It's basically saying, you've used up 90% of your pool. I'm going to stop issuing RIDs until you release the ceiling. And the idea is you fix the problem and then release the ceiling. All right? And also, the, 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 the other thing that could happen is you could change the RID pool size. And this gentleman up here said 500. All right? That's the standard default RID pool size. But you could put it up to an enormous number. So what would happen is when a DC requested a new RID pool, it would get this huge block of RIDs. And then you say, oh, I don't want that DC anymore. You've just thrown all those RIDs out of your domain. You know, and you find all your DCs were getting these huge blocks of RIDs. You retire your DCs, you've lost them. Um, so the actual RID block size is now capped at 15K. Um, there used to be an issue if you were creating, if you had a script creating thousands and thousands of security principles, what could happen is your DC would run out of RIDs. Well, before it ran out of RIDs, at 80% of RID usage on a DC, it would go and request a new RID pool. But because of speed, and this is back in, back in the good old days, because it was, everything was a lot slower, what could happen is the script could be running, and before it's got its new pool, it could have exhausted the pool. So you'd be running the script to generate your thousands of users from your new HR database. I particularly saw this with, with universities when they're onboarding the next you know, year's students and they'd run this script, and then what would happen is the RID pool would get exhausted 
and at that point, uh, the script would fail. Uh, so what they did is, rather than being at an 80% level, they dropped it to 50%. So when you've got 50% usage, it goes off and gets a new RID pool. And, but what customers used to do is they used to increase the RID pool size so that they didn't, when they were running the script, they didn't actually run out of RIDs. And you've got global RID size unlock available to you as well. So you've, you've got those options. So there is more, but what I want to do is just really just very, very quickly, just for, for fun, which just have a quick look at this. If you want to examine your RID pool, let's do this on DC1, actually, which is the, the RID master. Uh, if we go on, we're using, L, I'll use LDP again, because um, to be honest, that's the easiest way of doing it. So using LDP, what I can do is I do, actually, I need to be careful here because I'll connect to the wrong DC. Okay, and um, then, where have we gone? Connections, bind. So I've now connected here. Let's just change the font size and let's push the font size up to, actually, we probably get away with 20 point. Okay, so uh, that, that happens to be root DSE that we've got in there. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to view tree and I'm looking into the domain naming context. And if we, if we go down into the, the domain naming context, um, what we can see down here is under system is RID manager dollar. And under RID manager dollar is the RID available pool. This is a 64 bit number. And if we split that, so I'm using the utility to split it, and let's just run that, and let's bring that over there. And for those at the back, so that's its split. So there's the 1073, comma, 741, et cetera, you know, the number we had up there. So that's the maximum number, the top number, or the high part. It's the maximum number of RIDs you can have in the whole thing. And the low part is the next pool to be allocated. So if your next pool to be allocated is very high, all right, that is something you need to be worried about and start thinking about, you know, if, if, the, if this number, if the 2601 is approaching the high part, then you are going to run out of RIDs. But um, what we can do is now we can actually unlock the, this RID pool and give it double its size. And to do that, it's, sorry, wrong one. What, what it is, we just, ah, modify, that's what I wanted. Um, we use a blank DN because it's an operational attribute. And just so I don't type it wrongly, I've got the name of the attribute in there, which is SID compatibility version. And we'll just go back to LDP, drop that in there. Should do. Yeah, I've lost the ability to cut and paste. That's very strange. Why will it not? Oh, well. Copy. Paste. Hey, that works. So the UI, the, the actual, if I, oh, I know it's a touch screen. That's why I went wrong. Not really. Okay, value, value of one in there, enter that, and what we need is it's synchronous, we run that, and it says modified. It's actually modified an operational attribute. There's no distinct, the, there is no, it's, uh, there's no DN because it's an operational attribute. And if we just close that off and we double click this guy, notice that number has got rather bigger. And we drop that into the large integer converter again and run that and just put that up there. Can you see it's actually doubled this number of RIDs you can actually have in the domain. So it just, um, just to show you how that actually operates. Okay, so lots of other, so deferred uh, index creation. So if you changed, 
Uh, if you needed to re-index things, what could happen, particularly this was involved with exchange, you'd suddenly find all your domain controllers were re-indexing, where you can now defer the re index recreation and, until you reboot, or in fact you trigger uh, an index uh, um, or the running of the index creation. Offline domain joins have been improved enormously for particularly for direct access clients. So direct access clients need to pick up a whole bunch of group policy, all right, and you can now do an offline domain join that includes that as well. Uh, there's enhanced LDAP logging. The LDAP, log the LDAP behaviors have changed, and there's new ones added there. You've got active directory-based activation as well, which does automatic activation for Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012 machines. Um, and the, anyone use managed accounts? Okay, and probably frustrated that you could only use a managed account on one server, you can now use them across a web farm. So you can actually put a managed account across, so you're using the same managed account across multiple servers, which is particularly needed if you want to use managed accounts on a web farm. And of course, the PowerShell commands for replication support. So a huge lot of changes. So what do we get? We get just a more robust, better, but easier to install, more resilient Active Directory. And I think one of the things you should be checking out is having a look at dynamic access control. It might not be that you, for you today, but certainly in the future, um, it is definitely the way it's going. And claim, you'll see claims base coming in. You know, you were talking, there was talk about bring your own device. Well, bring your own device can do authentication against the Windows Azure Active Directory, claims involved. So claims very much more coming into that. And that, in an hour and 15 minutes precisely, um, is an introduction to what's new in Server 2012. Thank you for coming.